time is up. Uh, it's 10.30 and a little more. And uh, I see we do have uh, some participants uh, that has been locking on uh, the this presentation. So I would start uh, by welcoming you uh, for this uh, webinar in the in the series of, of what we call the nutrition basics, uh, an introduction to to protein and 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 maybe an, an understanding of proteins in pig feed. What are the sources? Uh, the what is amino acids and protein relation requirements and and how do we actually uh, formulate uh, pig feed with the with with respect to protein? Uh, of course, this uh, webinar was uh, originally planned a little earlier, but uh, unfortunately, due to to uh, still infections of Corona, uh, we had to postpone it. Uh, so I'm happy that uh, you all found time to log on, even though it was not uh, on the originally announced date. So, uh, yeah, my name, uh, as you might know, is uh, Jakob Dahl. I'm uh, the nutritionist and uh, R&D manager in Villefoss in Denmark, and um, will guide you through this uh, webinar uh, on, on proteins. Uh, let me just check. Yeah, so so introduction, you could say webin this webinar is, is on amino acids being the building blocks of protein uh, and and also on a little bit on on on, on component raw material knowledge uh, when it comes to protein. Uh, proteins are, as you might be aware, essential for lean gain. Um, but essentially, as protein is made out of amino acids, it is the uh, it are the is the amino acids that are actually the building blocks, and and why we have to uh, to observe the amino acid content and and not the the less um, the the digestibility of these amino acids uh, and and also the relative content of amino acids in in proteins. Um, of course, lean gain uh, that's the main focus, but of course, I also uh, Protein is is important for milk production, so this is why even if I've, I'm focusing on lean gain in this presentation, still it makes uh, it's it's just as relevant when we talk about uh, milk production. Um, also, uh, we have to, uh, I have at the end of the presentation some Danish requirements on amino acids uh, for for pigs in general and and different groups. Uh, and and but there is some new uh, knowledge that could be cons uh, considered a little bit controversial uh, because when we talk about protein we or amino acid profiles we are generally talking about what is is, is normally referred to as ideal protein uh, which sort of basically just explains or covers uh, defines a certain uh, amino acid profile for for uh, any growth state or, or, or development state of the peaks. But there's actually some indications that in special uh, conditions to a deviation can be beneficial when it comes to productivity, but I'll try to uh, tell you all about that. Um, typical protein sources for monogastric animals uh, is uh, especially, well, dairy prote protein may be not so relevant if we are looking into poultry. But especially when we uh, talk about uh, mammalians, uh, of course, dairy protein is, is essential for, for the young animals. Uh, when we talk about feed, it's typically a whey powder, could be skim milk powder, but uh, when milk prices, when demand on milk product, dairy products are generally high, skim milk powder is normally, from a price perspective, not uh, so relevant for, for animal feed. Uh, also, we have the whey protein concentrate, uh, and of course, there are some other permeates that, that does not contain protein. They are also re relevant. Fish meal is very widely accepted as, as a high quality uh, protein source for piglets. Uh, but please be aware then that quality of fish meal can be very, uh, de very variable. So fish meal to be considered as a high quality source, it has to be a good quality. Uh, blood plasma in general, of course, it has some challenges when it comes to, to uh, 
uh, animal protein uh, use. Uh, there are some markets that do not accept uh, animal proteins. Uh, so, and also, of course, I am realizing that there has been some concerns raised with regard to ASF on, on the risk of transmitting the disease with blood plasma. Handled correctly, this risk should be basically non-existing. Then also new sources of protein is coming into the market recently in the EU. There was an opening of, of utilizing insect protein meal in uh, animal feeds for monogastrics. Um, it can be discussed whether it belongs in the animal protein category or it is basically in a category on itself. Uh, but I think the properties of the insect protein meal will, will show to be more uh, similar to the animal proteins than, than to the traditional animal proteins than, than to the vegetable. When it comes to the vegetable proteins, uh, one of the, the well most well known, of course, is soybean meal, widely used. Uh, very good for pigs, um, has a protein content of anywhere from 40 to maybe 48 percent typically. Uh, if if we want uh, something that is even better or higher in protein, we do. Uh, there's a wide range of soy protein concentrates. Uh, then, of course, rapeseed meal to some extent. Also, rapeseed cakes are available, slightly lower to, to, to somewhat lower in protein than, than soybean meal. Uh, sunflower meal is available also here. Uh, quality can be very varying, especially when it comes to fiber content and protein content. Uh, faba beans, horse beans, field beans uh, are used in some areas in some countries. Uh, lupins not so common in the European market, but for example in the Australian market it's, it's somewhat used. And then also corn and wheat gluten also a meal or corn and wheat gluten concentrates can be, especially the concentrates can be very good for, for piglets. Uh, the gluten meals can be less uh, suitable for piglets, but again, where if price is, is, is interesting, it could be used for older animals. Potato protein concentrate, I uh, missed that word, also belongs to the group of, of highly digestible with a very high protein content. And then we see some new proteins coming into the market, the green protein based on grass or alfalfa uh, that could be typically from 35 to 50 percent. I might have forgotten something, but it's just to give you an overview of the types of protein. Uh, and then also yeast proteins are marketed strongly at the moment. Um, you could say it's more like, like functional products because usually the yeast products includes also cell wall, uh, yeast cell wall uh, components that could have uh, beneficial effect on, on the gut health and so on. Um, maybe actually the insect meal belongs into the same category of others, but again, yeast is not actually animal. It's not really vegetable. It's in a group on its own. And of course, also uh, what is called single cell proteins. Uh, maybe you could say that yeast belongs to this one, which is usually uh, residues of, of the, the microbial uh, ferment from from the microbial fermentation of, for example, amino acids and so on that is purified, uh, and uh, also we see some of that in the market. Uh, yeah. Um, what is wh wh why do we then need uh, a, a range of protein sources? Uh, of course, some of you might have noticed that I didn't put cereals uh, here uh, at all. And of course, except the, the gluten part, but but of course that's because, well, often they're not considered as protein carriers, but due to the relatively high content in the feed, actually often cereals uh, contribute with up to 50% of the protein of the feed. So we shouldn't forget those as well. But but uh, in this in this uh, overview, I sort of, uh, the, the thought was to say, okay, we have the protein sources and then the cereal, because the cereal will be what is, uh, the remaining part, more or less, of, of the feed. Uh, but you see uh, the, the protein content of, of these components are somewhat, usually somewhat higher of what the requirement of the animals and, and, and definitely the amino acid profile and digestibility can be very, very different between these products. Um, 
one reason why animal proteins are interesting compared to vegetable proteins and why we, 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 we use some of the processed um, vegetable proteins uh, for younger piglets, younger animals, is because most of the vegetable proteins contain some anti-nutritional factors, which are actually the natural defenses from the plants to, to sort of pre prevent being eaten. And, and just a quick overview, see soybeans or legumes, you could say, uh, soybean, peas, beans uh, contains uh, trypsin and, and chymotrypsin inhibitors, meaning they sort of counteract the, in, the enzymatic uh, digestion of protein in, in, in the stomach and in the pig. Uh, so, uh, but luckily they are fairly easily uh, denaturated or destroyed by, by heat treatment. That is why it's essential that soybean meal and so on is, is toasted to have the the, the major part of, of uh, these anti-nutritional factors that are destroyed. Uh, beans, peas and lubins also contain lectins, also destroyed by heat treatment, uh, which, which has, has an, a, a damaging effect on the epithelium, uh, increasing the endogenous protein loss. Peas, beans and rapeseed contains tannins, today less than, than, than earlier because of, of breeding of, of, uh, of the different types, uh, but the tannins can form complexes with feed protein, uh, which could be enzymes, and due to poor palatability also has an, uh, could have a negative impact on, on feed intake. Also, rapeseed meal especially contains glucosinolates, um, um, and, and they are a little bit more di difficult to handle because uh, you can sort of reduce the level by heat treatment, but if you heat tre treat them too high or too intensely, actually some of the, the breakdown products can be even more uh, aggressive. And the challenge is that it, it, it's interfering with the hormone uh, production and inhibiting growth, uh, lip reproduction rate and so on. And then luckily we don't see that too much anymore. Uruca acid can also be present in some old rapeseed types. Uh, which have a, a negative impact on, on the formation of uh, lean tissue or muscle tissue. Uh, but as I said, luckily, we don't see that too much uh, anymore. Um, so what is crude protein? Um, well, when, when we talk about crude protein, it, it's actually two components. It's real protein, so to speak, which contains of, a, which is basically amino acids or peptides, which are basically just chains of amino acids and then non-protein nitrogen. Because when we determine crude protein analytically, what we actually do is to measure the, the nitrogen content in the substrate. And then for feed purposes, we multiply it with 6.25. This is uh, internationally accepted as saying this is crude protein. But if we have feed components with a high level of, of non-protein nitrogen, then it's not actually available protein for monogastrics. Ruminants during uh, the, the, the microbial population in the rumen might be able to utilize some of it, this NPN uh, and, and the bacteria, the, the microorganisms could actually produce amino acids based on, on, on the NPN. But, but generally that is not possible for monogastrics. Um, so NPN protein is relevant uh, when, when, especially when looking into more untraditional protein components. As I said earlier, protein is simply a large number of amino acids bound together uh, in, in all kinds of formations. And all amino acids have a, a basic uh, construction uh, that, that looks like this. And what is defining the, 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 the specific amino acid is the group here marked with as an R here. We have the acid part over here and the amino group here. So, this is what differentiates the, the different amino acids as uh, shown here on, on the right. Uh, for pigs the, and, and, and a number of uh, mammalians, uh, the, the, the amino acids that are marked with, uh, with red uh, frames here are the ones uh, that are considered essential. Then we also have a number of semi-essential. They can to some extent be uh, synthesized based on some one of the uh, or replaced or by 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 the essential amino acids, and then eventually uh, at the end I have arginine also with a with a special uh, frame, 
because it is somewhat uh, sometimes discussed whether arginine can be considered a semi-essential amino acid or not. Uh, for example, in, 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 in the US, arginine is often uh, on the list of uh, recommended levels. We don't see that in Denmark. Uh, there's some speculation that uh, with the ever less uh, use of, uh, of animal protein, uh, which typically contains significantly less arginine than the animal protein, uh, the vegetable proteins typically consists, uh, contains less. Maybe we just didn't know earlier that arginine could be a limiting factor. But until now, I haven't seen uh, a lot that is sort of supporting that. So uh, usually we have these 11 uh, essential amino acids, uh, and then to some extent cysteine and, and tyrosine can be uh, substituted by either uh, methionine or, or phenylalanine. Uh, the, the digestion absorption of protein or at the end of amino acid, because protein can not be absorbed, only amino acids and dye and tripeptides can be absorbed. But in, it starts in the stomach with the, a pepsin uh, that is activated by a pH. It's, uh, a certain pH range will activate uh, the pepsin enzyme. And then it moves on uh, into to the intestine where trypsin and chemotrypsin, if you remember, that was the, the, the two enzymes that is inhibited by some of the antinutritional factors. And, and also a number of different enzymes will, will start breaking down the, 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 the complex protein into more simpler uh, formations. Uh, eventually in the small uh, intestine, it is uh, completed and, and uh, finally end up with simple individual amino acids or these D or three peptides that can then be absorbed. The peptides will within the epithelial cells then be further broken down into actual single individual amino acids and then amino acids will be transported into the bloodstream. Um, as you see in this uh, diagram, uh, sodium plays a very important role uh, together with, with uh, hydrogen ions in order to, to facilitate the absorption. So you could say a deficient and sodium deficient uh, animal will probably not be able to, uh, to be effective in the absorption of uh, amino acids. Um, and then once we have the amino acids available in the bloodstream, of course they can, uh, they, they will be a part of the protein deposition, protein synthesis in the body, uh, but it's a constant process. There's also always a, 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 a degradation of protein, but as long as the synthesis or deposition is higher than, than the breakdown, the degradation, of course, the animal will add in on, on lean tissue. Uh, so it's not a, a static uh, thing. Once the, the, the muscle has been built, so to speak, uh, it, it doesn't stay unchanged forever. Uh, there will be a, a degradation as well. Uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why um, when we talk about uh, organic selenium being deposited in, in lean tissue, uh, it can actually be mobilized uh, even though the, the, the mechanism is not so well described. Okay, when we talk about essential amino acids, this means that, that animals cannot build or synthesize these uh, amino acids by themselves. Um, the the, the, the non-essential amino acids can either be synthesized in the animal or based on the essential amino acids that is modified. So this means that the essential amino acids must be supplied through the feed in a sufficient level, uh, something that sort of covers the demand or the requirement for optimal productivity. Um, so what was, does, do we mean with high productivity? Of course, we need high daily gain. We need high milk yield uh, for reproduction. You know, we, we need high large, uh, to, to have large litters uh, that's sort of correlated to the daily gain uh, with high fetal gain and mammary development as well. We need high quality, so we need lean meat. We don't want meat that is uh, spotted or um, well, too fat, at least not we, if we, we need, if, for quality purposes, intramuscular fat is more uh, 
require than, than the extra muscular fat. Uh, then if we talk about protein quality, also we need to maintain high health because, uh, well, for animal welfare reasons, for cost reasons, but also uh, because fighting diseases and so on uh, costs energy. It also costs protein that then are not available for, for gain or, or milk production. We also need to have a very good uh, utilization of the feed to have a low feed cost with a good feed conversion. And at the end also we have to uh, address that at, as much as the nitrogen bound in the protein needs to stay within the animal because once we get it out into to the manure and eventually out in, in the environment, it is a nutrient that we have to control. And, and, and especially in, in areas with high level of, of production of animals, and nitrogen uh, is a, a challenge as well as phosphorus. Um, so protein does not only uh, go for, sorry, for, um, for lean gain, it's also a matter of uh, producing a number of enzymes, hormones, and, and, and yeah, transporters and membrane functions in the cells. But of course, volume wise, it is the lean gain and all the milk production uh, that takes up um, the vast majority of, of the protein from the feed. So the animal needs protein, but you could, to be more specific, the animal needs specific essential amino or specific levels of uh, volumes of essential amino acids. Um, so the essential amino acids is generally uh, lysine, methionine, threonine, isoleucine, leucine, tryptophan, valine, phenyl, alanine, and histidine, as I mentioned earlier. And then the semi-essential amino acids um, and this story about the arginine, which is definitely essential for some species. Uh, and as I mentioned, it, it is sometimes discussed whether they are essential for, for pigs as well. When we talk about limiting amino acids, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we need amino acids in a special uh, certain relation uh, to have the optimal supply. This means that we don't need the same amount of lysine, methionine, and so on. Uh, it, they, they need at, at different stages of growth, they need to be present in the feed uh, in, a, in a, spe a special relation that is correlating, of course, to, to, to how the pigs are utilizing. Uh, for pigs, what we call the first limiting amino acid is lysine. This is not because lysine has a special role. It's simply because lysine, when we say the first limiting amino acid, it's simply because lysine is the most, uh, the, the, the amino acid that is most probable with the typical feed components to be in, in deficiency. Why? If we start from the top, adding lysine to a diet quickly will make it much easier to cover the requirement of the peak. But then once we have covered the requirement for the first limiting amino acids, it's not limiting anymore. Then we will see the second limiting amino acids, which for pigs are methionine and so on. So, so sometimes this first limiting amino acid concept is misunderstood as being the only or the most important, but but you cannot say that because all of them are important, and it's sort of the a matter of the lowest bar setting the bar. So it doesn't matter if we just put a lot of lysine in the diet; it just means that another am amino acid could be limiting or will be limiting. Um, and and with typical feed components, lysine is is just the first one to be uh, deficient. So. Uh, when we look into uh, the, the lysine, so you could say part of, you could say that, that uh, in typical diets for piglets, growers, and finisher, you can see what is the actual uh, synthetic source in the typical diet. And you could see here, for example, for piglets, uh, roughly 65% of the lysine in a typical pre-starter diet will actually be from synthetic sources or crystalline sources or a hundred percent pure source uh, industrially produced. Then if we move on to growers, finishers, it's it's less. And, and you can see when we talk about tryptophan valine, actually 
you see that they are mainly used in piglet feed, not so commonly in grower finisher feed, and simply because grower finishers, relatively with a higher protein level, easier from the normal protein components will cover the requirements of the pigs. Also, it's also related to the fact that, that the levels are different and, and maybe also slightly on, on the profile of the amino acids. Um, and then the story about ideal protein. Ideal protein is defined as the optimal relation between amino acids to achieve a maximum utilization of feed protein for production, gain or milk. Um, in pigs, at least, first limiting amino acids, lysine usually is used as baseline and other amino acids expressed as relative to lysine in percentage. Um, the ideal protein amino acid profile depends on production parameters or stage of life or maybe even genotypes. Uh, but, you know, genotypes, then, then we are really out in, in very small differences that in, in, can be difficult to handle in, in, in practical life. This is an example of an ideal protein for finisher pigs um, from, from the, and, and as it is presented by, by uh, the Danish uh, SEGIS uh, organization, uh, this is per feed unit, Danish feed unit, but uh, this is not the column that is interesting. The interesting column is basically here. So you can see lysine set as a, at 100%, then methionine should make out 30%, minimum 30% of, of the lysine level. And in this case, 59%, 4.2 of, of 7.1, should uh, be methionine and cysteine. If you are a little challenged on the cysteine, uh, contribution, of course, you can compensate by increasing the methionine. Uh, the reason I have uh, something in brackets here shows that the variation across a typical finisher stage from roughly 30 to 150, 120 kilos. The same goes with threonine and so on. Um, of course, these uh, ideal protein uh, is no better than, than, than the research behind it. And also, so it's, it's a combination of trials, requirement trials, modeling, and so on. Uh, and and they are, these uh, profiles are could be developed over time. Another thing we have to address once we start talking about uh, digestible protein is um, the endogenous protein, because that's a protein loss uh, that uh, is due to secretions in the animal. So it's protein that has actually been absorbed or amino acids that have actually been absorbed, but then again excreted as a part of the enzymes um, and um, uh, and other compounds containing amino acids. Uh, typically, it is uh, from saliva, from bile, other secretions from stomach and pancreas, and it is also old, uh, well, epithelial cells. They have a certain lifespan, so they are uh, rejected and, and will uh, be removed with the feces. Uh, and this is not to be mistaken for protein that is not digestible. It's simply something that was used and then excreted. Uh, knowing the endogenous losses, the, the standardized uh, digestibilities can be uh, uh, calculated. Otherwise, when if we look uh, more into the fecal, it's more an, an apparent digestibility. Um, so um, this is the difference uh, be, if you just look at fecal the, the digesti digestibility or on a standardized uh, ileal digestibility. Um, and there's some numbers here showing how much endogenous nitrogen uh, and thereby by analytical methods uh, also will be char characterized as protein and and uh, this is the the metabolic body weight uh, also a standard in, in in nutrition so prote protein deposition is determined by genetic potential of the animal of course but also the protein content of the feed and as i said before the protein quality um, it's limited by uh, if the protein supply through the feed is too low either poor digestibility uh, poor feed intake, and but also by at least more general, general, genotypically uh, trait, saying okay, the pigs simply cannot deposit more. 
it does not uh, relate to the feed. If if we are providing enough amino acids for, for but the pig cannot do anymore, it's, it's a limitation of the animal itself. Um, and uh, there's some differences when we talk about the mammary gland, but still it's the, the low protein content in feed could be limiting. Um, uh, even though that the sow is actually able to, to compensate by mobilizing uh, protein from the body. It's not recommended, but it is possible. Um, so if we look at, at something for, for on, on the protein requirement for sows, for lactating sows, um, this is some, some Danish research done a few years ago by Strate, uh, showing that if we look into standard ileal digestion, digestible protein. Uh, so, so it's not crude. Well, it is crude protein, but it's the digestible part. You see that increasing protein uh, from from up to roughly 135 grams uh, crude pro digestible pro crude protein per kilo of feed, we see an increasing litter weight gain. Um, and uh, from there on, there's nothing more going on. If we would continue this line and, and, and start measuring also the uh, nitrogen uh, compounds in the in the milk, we would actually see uh, an increasing uh, non-protein nitrogen content in, 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 in the milk as well. Uh, but this is a way to, to show or, or, or determine the level of optimal crude protein. This is relatively simple because of course, this level is depending on the amino acid profile, but in this uh, trial, of course, they, they, they aim to have the most optimal amino acid composition. So summarizing that into protein. 135 grams of digestible crude protein equals just around 16% crude protein in the diet. Uh, the challenge is uh, many farms uh, experience some neonatal diarrhea is challenges in the piglets if they uh, move significantly above 120 uh, grams or 130 grams. So uh, even though it's never been demonstrated in trials, there's a wide uh, understanding that the high level of protein in lactation feed could lead to a neonatal piglet diarrhea. Uh, if we look into finishes, we can see the, the, the balance here. Uh, and it says that less than 50% of the protein from the feed is actually deposited as protein in the body. This is because we have these endogenous losses that I mentioned earlier, especially for finishers still, we see not always optimally balanced uh, amino acid profiles, meaning that either there are some limitations or we simply supply more than the pig can utilize. Could also be due to some anti-nutritional factors that to some extent could increase the endogenous losses and basically an oversupply of protein. So if we look at this, you see 100% from the feed. In this example, 38% is only deposited. We have 44% of the nitrogen actually excreted by urine and 18% uh, through um, uh, feces. So probably we will, well, I was about to say never, but I think we should be careful not using that word. Say in, in, in the short time span, probably will not be able to never be able to see a, a, a significantly higher utilization. Of course, in theory, it can be done, but it will be relatively expensive. So I, I don't think that commercially it will be so uh, attractive. Uh, under supply, especially if some of the essential amino acids are too low, or it could be also be under supply of energy, vitamins and minerals. Special energy, of course, is important to make sure that this deposition of protein also requires energy. So it's not enough just to not consider energy content of the feed and simply just push protein in because then you will not get the, the optimal uh, uh, deposition and utilization. You need to make sure that there's a certain level of energy to protein ratio as well. As well. Also, amino acids can actually act as antagonists on other amino acids. So this is why also, again, the uh, amino acid profile should be optimized to be as close as, as possible to the ideal uh, protein uh, profile. Um, so high level of leucine actually reduces the utilization of isoleucine. 
as well as arginine reduces the utilization of lysine. So this is, of course, something that, that uh, sort of speaks against including arginine supplementation uh, at a high level. Uh, heat treatment can also reduce protein efficiency. Uh, the, the most typical is if we see uh, some heat treated products, it could be soybean meal, could be DTTS, which I just now remembered that I didn't even mention in my initial slide on protein components. Uh, what happens is actually that that you, with too intensive heat treatment, you you uh, in the press where lysine is in presence of sugars, glucose, uh, the sugar and and the lysine will will sort of react, meaning that the lysine will become undigestible. Uh, on the other hand, insufficient heat treat heat treatment will not deactivate the 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 enzymatic inhibitors. So again, we have a poor uh, utilization. And, and other uh, anti-nutrition factors as well, such as the glucosinolates in, in rapeseed meal. Evaluating protein components uh, requires uh, <laughs> some good knowledge on protein, the amino acid content of the feed material, uh, which means that, that there needs to be a significant uh, volume of analyzers to sort of know about the variability and, and uh, of also from year to year, the harvest season can also influence the, the quality and the levels. Of course, the requirements of the animals and also about the digestion process. Uh, how do the feed behave when it is introduced into the animal? Um, for the, often we speak about lysine alone. I explained why based on, 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 on the ideal protein, it's much easier than having to mention at least 11 amino acids each time. Um, providing we have the correct amino acid profile, uh, roughly 21 grams of standard ileal digestible lysine will lead to one kilo of gain, body gain. Um, um, but it's of course, uh, uh, um, some with some modifications because we also know that young and young pigs have almost well a very high level of lean gain and as the pigs get older this shifts a little bit more into the direction of more fat deposition so to have very lean pigs we need to have a very high daily gain making them reach the desired uh, carcass weight at an earlier stage because this is about the uh, the fat deposition is, is purely an age related uh, issue. But you can sort of, from a general perspective, look into the feed intake. How much does that sort of act, add up into to lysine per day? And then you could basically from that estimate how much should the pigs actually grow? And if they don't do that, well, either you are oversupplying or there's something uh, preventing the pigs from, from expressing their, their genetic potential. Um, we also need to make sure that we are as close to the requirements as possible, partly because of environmental uh, concerns. So also this is why we work with multiple uh, feeding phases. Um, the problem is, well, even though the benefit is that we can feed closer to the requirement of the animal, the problem is it requires more complicated feeding systems. But again, on the other hand, if nitrogen excretion is a challenge for us, either from an environmental side or maybe even from a, from a gut health side, uh, again, multiple feeding phases uh, will help us out. Um, there's been some uh, attempts to sort of feed finishers basically with cereals uh, from, let's say, 100 kilos up. Um, this could harm the, the, the lean meat percentage of the animals uh, once they, they, they reach the slaughterhouse. So be aware of that. Um, about the recommended amino acid profiles, here I've shown the, the, the Danish recommendation uh, as, as a profile. So I have the lysine, which is at 100%, uh, and then we have piglets uh, 9 to 30, as it is in the current Danish uh, recommendation. And you, you, and and the gray bars shows the so-called ideal protein recommendation for piglets. And you will notice that um, well, uh, from um, from valine, the Danish recommendation is slightly lower, 
if we look into histidine, leucine, isoleucine, it's actually somewhat lower. It actually represents only 86% of the ideal protein profile. And I'll uh, come back to why it is so. You see the, the methionine and, and the typical synthetic amino acids uh, are uh, fully uh, to, to, to the full extent uh, matching the ideal uh, amino acid profile for, for piglets. Um, the ideal amino acid profile is typically, well, as I mentioned earlier, based on modeling and, and relatively simple trials, single factor dose response trials. Uh, SEGIS now have introduced a new way of determining optimal amino acid uh, profiles. Uh, you could say it's more a three dimensional compared to the old system that is more two dimensional. Uh, this is taking into consideration the antagonistic effects of other amino acids. At the same time, young piglets might be challenged if protein is high because the, the, the digestive capacity is, is sort of challenged. Um, and um, uh, the reducing the, the level of essentially amino acids normally or historically um, and still is to some extent not possible without reducing crude, crude protein or the other way around. You cannot reduce crude protein unless you reduce the to some extent, the essential amino, or at least some of the essential amino acids. Only recently, isoleucine, leucine, and histidine has been available as commercially available amino acids. Still, they are not fully implemented uh, because the, there's still some work to do on understanding how to use them uh, on the best. So earlier, reducing crude protein levels would mean that some of the amino acids would be reduced, say, meaning that you might as well just turn down uh, something like lysines to make the profile suit. So this is a quite uh, complicated uh, table, uh, but it, that's unfortunately how it is when you want to work in, in more than two dimensions. So just to make you a, a quick explanation, uh, in this trial there was a number of, of different uh, groups uh, ranging from fruit, uh, digestible crude protein uh, of um, let me just see, 120 roughly to 200 very high, which is sort of comparable to almost 14% crude protein, which most of you know is very low for pro for piglets, up to 24, which is quite high. On the same time, in on on the other dimension, they were looking into the relation about uh, of of lysine to leucine. Um, as it is uh, also described in, in, in the protein profile. And in this matter, we, we could, in this table, they, we see the, the results on feed conversion. Um, I just need to change the slide. So you could see 100, 100 is ideal protein. So you see it's all the way, all the way down here. Uh, the best feed conversion was actually here. Um, the norm, the safe, uh, protein recommendation from Denmark is, is in this area. The normal standard recommendation is, is at this level. So you can see 1.56. I'm sorry, this is expressed in feed units, uh, but you could, in, for piglets, you could calculate roughly 1.14 uh, feed units per kilo. Uh, so you see here 1.56 to 1.43, that's a significant improvement. Uh, and it just turns worse if we really go low in protein. Uh, so this was on the feed conversion. What was maybe even more interesting, because talking about pre-starter feed, piglet diarrhea, weaning diarrhea, post-weaning diarrhea is always what we are discussing. Again, you see the same ranges on the scales, but again, normal recommendation was set at 100% uh, diarrhea treatments. And you see if we, even of course, if we increase protein, normally we would expect more diarrhea. But you see, this is not sort of, it is also correlated to the lysine leucine relation. And the lowest uh, level of diarrhea was actually just 18% of what they saw in the, in, in the standard feed recommendation, uh, which was on, of course, a relatively low level of protein, but also with an atypical level of lysine to leucine or the other way around, if you would prefer that. So we, we also, this is the background for Sega's recommendation, 86% of the ideal protein profile uh, on leucine, isoleucine, histidine, and valine is somewhere in, 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 in the middle. 
Um, what happens? Uh, another approach you could say to why reducing protein could actually improve performance is basically because we cut the excess by adding free amino acids to more and more um, uh, for more and more amino acids we can sort of cut the excess of other amino acids uh, thereby um, limiting or the catabolic breakdown because excess protein getting rid of that costs energy energy that then will not be available for protein deposition and immune responses and so on uh, but there is also an and and uh, uh, some uh, considerations or, or theories going on that synthetic lysine is either sulfates or HCl as they will, will will add into the acidity acidification of the stomach content which again then will activate pepsin improve protein digestion maybe also help protecting the pigs more against the microorganisms coming orally into the into the gut so you see here in this case we cover 100% of the lysine from the co components. In this case, we reduce crude protein, but then add up with synthetic uh, amino acids. And it actually uh, is quite common today. 10 years ago, it was not uncommon to see a pre-starter with more than 20% crude protein. Today, I think most places we are maybe even at 18%. Uh, and you see it's exactly the same for the other amino acids. So when it comes to a recommended amino acid profile for other animal groups, you see that there are changes. Uh, again, lysine is 100%. And then we see if we, for example, look from, from uh, piglets to, um, to, to finishes on, on phenyl, aniline, and, and tyrosine, you see that the older pigs actually have a slightly higher requirement, uh, just as it also goes for valine. Um, and you could also put it into a table showing um here the the relative recommended level of amino acid compared to uh, uh, the 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 to lysine so what is the change over time and you see histidine requirement actually relatively decreases with with increasing age or body weight whereas methionine is sort of increasing just as, as uh, tryptophan uh, when it comes to phenylalanine itself it's more or less the same level once the pigs exceed 30 kilos uh, so this is the reason why we need to have different profiles to different age groups of, of pigs uh, if we look uh, include the sows as well you see a much stronger difference uh, this is because the gestating sows of course have a different uh, gain a profile and especially of the lactating sows, the, 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 the amino acid profile of milk is different from, from lean gain. So this is why uh, we see this uh, difference. Uh, and if I include uh, all the, uh, the animal groups, uh, we have something that looks like this. Like this. Um, of course, this is expressed as relative profile but when if we then start, start looking in, into the absolute content of the feed we see much bigger differences of course this has something to do with also the feed intake of the animals uh, not surprisingly the piglets with the lowest feed intake of course needs they have a high requirement per kilo gain maybe but definitely they eat less every day so we need to concentrate the feed um, yeah and then to return to this uh, issue about uh, multi-phase feeding, the example here is based on finishers. We could have included piglets as well, but now I'm, I'm speaking mainly on finishers. Um, this is some modeling I've done saying, OK, if we if we say that we need 21 grams of lysine per kilo body gain. I'm using the same factor all the way through even though there might be some slight changes depending on, on the body weight of the pig. Uh, and you can see having a normal albitop feeding curve, uh, you see in the beginning here from when, when we, we could actually end up having a, a, a deficient supply of lysine because uh, the blue bar here, blue line shows the, the daily 
uh, supply of uh, SID lysine, even though in theory uh, this the the gray line shows the requirement uh, because the, the this orange line shows the the, the calculated at libitum feed intake. Of course, there's some farms working with restricted feeding, uh, typically mostly uh, liquid feeding, and you see this is what happens if we um, start restricting the feed. You might notice that that the area between the requirement and and the and the and 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 the supply is fairly large in in this in the first ad libitum situation and somewhat smaller in the restrictive feeding. But this is with a single phase feed. If we then start calculating on multiple phases, you see then we have the blue line here, daily lysine supply at three uh, feeding phases. Uh, and you see we will get much closer to the requirement, the orange line. Um, and, and again, if and especially, but especially here in, in the, the, the ad libitum situation, we'll again ha have a, a, some oversupply from the single phase, the light blue line and the three phase feeding. But again, we will reduce it dramatically. This is also the case if we're talking about restricted feedings, but multiple feeding phases might actually be more attractive in an ad libitum situation. Uh, doing some calculations saying, okay, what are the savings actually? Uh, if we sort of think only in, 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 in protein or lysine, uh, you can see that using uh, a, a three phase feeding in different uh, on different levels, we can actually save somewhere between 50 and 60 percent uh, of, um, of 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 the lysine uh, per pig uh, without actually challenging the performance. Uh, so we can also achieve somewhere some of this just by re restricting the feed allowance, but then we will get a lower a daily gain. Potentially, we could get a higher feed conversion, but the, it seems that the genetics today is so efficient that it does not really influence too much. Uh, potentially, we should see a better lean meat percentage in restricted feeding. Also, I think today the genetics are so efficient that, that this is also uh, not so much as it used to be. In theory, we should have a lower feeding cost and a lower environmental impact by using restrictive feeding. But this shows that we can actually gain uh, just as much by, by using multiple feeding phases. At the end, I would like to address uh, the, 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 the issue of amino acid fermentation, which is of course related to liquid feeding systems. Some countries, some areas, liquid feeding systems is, is, is very widely used, others it's more dry feed. The, the, the background is, in an liquid feeding system, typically there will be a microbial population. And they seem to have a, a, a liking to synth synthetic lysine, to some extent threonine as well, but especially lysine. Um, it depends very much whether you are using uh, acidic uh, components such as whey or maybe even adding acids. Also, uh, it's of course worse or more uh, pronounced in what I call the, the older type of feeding liquid feeding systems. If we are looking into the more modern type with, with which is free of residues, which circulates water or acidified water between feedings and so on, it's not nearly as, as, as profound. But talking about traditional or you could say old fashioned liquid feeding systems uh, with residues that will stay in the pipes and in the tank between feedings, there will be some fermentation. Uh, normally, and and um, in Denmark we calculate uh, on two levels, saying okay, if we have a residual total volume in the system, including the pipes and the tank, of anywhere from 15 to 35 percent of the volume actually fed, we should actually consider roughly 25 percent of the synthetic lysine and threonine is lost due to bacterial fermentation. If we're working with even higher residual volumes it is actually 50%, but only 25% on threonine. I've seen examples of 70 to 80% loss of the synthetic lysines, and especially at this time where synthetic lysine or amino acids in general are extremely expensive, this is a very poor way. Of course, you can just add more, 
taking that into consideration, that's also what we typically do uh, practically, but it can be very expensive. So depending on the price relation between acidification and lysine, uh, I would normally recommend that to add acids, formic acid is a very good product. You can also get more acid blends that also prevents uh, formation of, of yeasts and, and, and molds. But you should al always uh, aim at a pH. Again, this is one of the, the traditional systems. You should add a, a, aim for a pH of less than 4.5. Uh, you could increase synthetic lysine, but that can turn out to be very expensive. You could also increase crude protein, uh, which relatively will reduce the proportion of synthetic lysine used. Um, so, but again, some farms see challenges, health challenge, gut health challenges if they increase crude protein too much, and there might also be some environmental issues to 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 take into consideration. Um, this is a very big table, I apologize for that, but it just shows what happens if we do no compensation. So if we say, okay, we aim for per kilo 10.3 grams per kilo of lysine uh, and 6.5 in, um, in, uh, in, in threonine, um, you could actually, uh, if you need to compensate by at the same crude protein by adding more synthetic lysine, uh, you should actually uh, have uh, go for this. This means that you should aim for in this situation. Of course, it depends on on the actual formulation of the feed. But you would see total lysine gram, not digestible, but total will have to be increased by one gram per kilo. If we include the crude protein, we are roughly at the same level. It could be actually be cheaper. You see, we use 0.7 percent more uh, soybean meal. If we have a, the, the severe case, you could see that, that we need to increase uh, up to uh, more, more than three grams of total lysine. Either, uh, and, and this means that we would have to uh, actually change. I think I made, made a typo here because this does not make sense. Uh, we, we need really to, to increase the, 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 for example, soybean meal uh, to, to do that. So, it should be, you see here at the bottom, I've included this, the addition of synthetic lysine and threonine. And you see from the no compensation point of view, we are at 5.1 grams per kilo. You see here, same crude protein, 7.2, up to 11.6. So that's more than twice as much synthetic lysine required if we have a very big uh, residual volume. And uh, what happens? Well, if we feed the bacteria in the liquid feeding system with amino acids instead of feeding the pig or in general just supply, under supply, then um, these are sort of rules of thumbs where we could, what, how much should we actually expect uh, performance to suffer? And, and based on the example on, on the fermentation uh, earlier, you see here if we are 7% or 14% down in lysine, we could actually expect to have a respectively 20, 40 grams less daily gain, uh, or in the same time frame, one, two to four kilos less carcass weight, a feed conversion up to 0.14 reduced, and even a reduction of one unit in, in lean meat. Another thing is biogenic amines can be formed if there is fermentation of amino acids, which could lead to poor palatability. I've seen some uh, examples in, uh, in lactation feed liquid where we did see some fermentation and the sow sim simply did not want to eat it. As soon as we got that, the fermentation under control, the feed intake of the lactating sows would uh, again come up. So be aware of that as well. So I've spent very close to one hour and uh, I hope uh, this gave you some information that you can use in your everyday work. And uh, I sh I'm ready for questions, should you have any. Yes, we have four questions for now. Um, the first one is, does it make any difference if the amino acids are from protein or synthetic? Uh, well, you could say that from the point of view of the peak, 
Uh, as long as we calculate in digestible amino acids, no, it does not make any difference. Uh, I mean, lysine is lysine, uh, but it could have an impact on, as I've just uh, explained, on fermentation uh, loss, or it could also have an impact on, on the environmental issues, nitrogen excretion and so on. Um, is there any restrictions or requirements about maximum quantity of added synthetic amino acids? Well, there is some uh, institutions who uh, recommend a certain maximum level of synthetic uh, amino acids. Um, it's mainly based on some research uh, on, on the dynamics, on the time of absorption, saying, OK, the theory is synthetic amino acids probably will be absorbed quicker than amino acids from protein that first of all needs to be digested or broken down and then absorbed. And, and the concern is that this, if, if one amino acid is too much in synthetic, it will all be present in the bloodstream very quickly. And once the pig, the body or organism uh, realize that I don't need it because I need other amino acids to be able to produce protein, then the, it'll start getting rid of it again. And then eventually the remaining uh, amino acids will, will sort of come a little bit later because they need to be digested first from the protein. Uh, but until now, I've not seen anything convincing on that, uh, but it is, should be taken into consideration that that there could be. So typically uh, it's lysine that is in question uh, because as I uh, in, in the start said, it's often lysine that is it is added at the highest level. Typically, People uh, say 30% of the total lysine, uh, roughly 30%, no more should actually be from synthetic source. Okay, um, next question. What is the difference between polypeptides and peptides? Uh, it's simply a matter of, of, of indicating how long are the chains. So peptides is, is, is a general term. Polypeptides just says that it's many. Uh, probably 50 amino acids or, or something like that and, and peptides is the general term and then we have the D and 3 peptides which is as the name indicates two and three amino acids. And the last question for now, how can it be that for piglets more lysine results in less diarrhea? Yeah that, that's also um, one question that is discussed somehow uh, to, to some now I mentioned it earlier a little bit that there might be a, an, a, an effect of acidification, which generally have a positive impact on, on, on gut health. Uh, but it could also be that, that um, there's uh, less antagonistic uh, effect between amino acids when, when we look on relatively more lysine. But it's, it's not well described. There's no, to my knowledge, no trials that sort of for sure determines what is actually the reason. But for now, the theory is mainly this about the acidification. Very well. Uh, if there are no more questions, I'll just give you a minute or so to, to, to come up with the last question, uh, should there be one. But um, thank you for listening in today. Uh, watching. Uh, don't forget that uh, we have more webinars coming up. Uh, the next web webinar is on Excelit um, uh, for, for Dairy Cows, uh, sort of a, the next level uh, cap, uh, calculator, uh, how to use the calculator. And the next pick webinar will be in the last one in the series of Nutrition Basics, which will address uh, the topics of micronutrients and additives in pig feed. And it will be uh, the 7th of April. Uh, I hope you will uh, sign up and join in. Uh, it will be brief because there are a lot of micronutrients and additives to address, but not to make it too uh, difficult to follow. Uh, it will be sort of a review. It seems that there are no more questions. You also were always welcome to send an email, ask any questions uh, if you uh, come up with them after with the webinar and also the webinar can be reviewed from our uh, webpage. 
then I'll just say thank you for watching and uh, see you next time.